today I'm going to be talking about how to use your vulnerabilities to train your developers on security. Uh, security training is becoming a much bigger topic um, as seen as a you know high ROI activity in application security. So I'm going to go over um, a few things today on the topic. So I'm going to start with uh, just some interesting things that we found from training tens of thousands of software developers. Uh, I'm going to go over how to create a successful secure coding training program. Uh, then I'm going to talk uh, more about you know the, the the title of the presentation. How do you train developers using your own uh, vulnerabilities? And then I'm going to do a demo of our platform and kind of show you how you can do this in practice. So I'm I'm going to start with as I mentioned insights from tens of thousands of developers, and the data is from uh, lessons uh, that we've that we have assessments, challenges, reported vulnerabilities, and so the interaction uh, with these people is, um, is is what we've looked at to be able to determine some, some very interesting insights. So um, one disclaimer before getting into it is that uh, we're talking about the 2017 OWASP top 10, not the 2021 OWASP top 10 that, that was just uh, published. Um, so uh, we're currently updating our content and, um, and data, so it will be reflective of the new uh, top 10 in, in December. So what are the top two vulnerabilities that developers find easiest to fix? They are external entities and cross-site scripting. And so we looked at, you know, why might this be the case? Why are those the, the two easiest effects? And, and it really comes down to two things. Education, if you educate developers on these vulnerabilities, they're extremely easy to fix as well as the fact that frameworks make them uh, extremely easy. So once developers have the knowledge and understand the frameworks, they can more easily um, fix these vulnerabilities. So they're, they're very easy for developers to fix. What are the top two vulnerabilities developers find hardest to fix? And so looking at, at all of these developers, we found broken access control and bro broken object level authorization. And so when looking into the data, you know, why are developers having issues with, with these areas in particular? Well, they're, they're more complex to fix, right? It's not uh, leveraging a framework or leveraging something that's relatively easy. And there's no one way to fix these issues. There's a lot of issues that encompass um, access control and authorization. So um, it's really about having a mindset to think through all of the possible um, issues that can can arise and training on the fundamentals rather than memorizing a specific syntax or framework or something like that. Um, so that's why this is uh, these are particularly hard to fix. What are the top two vulnerabilities that our customers tell us they're having the biggest issues with? So this is not just from our data, but this is them uh, telling us that they're having these issues. And one is uh, using components with known vulnerabilities, so open source software, and also again, broken authentication. They know they're having issues in, with, with those areas. Open source, it's so easy now to pull in third-party libraries. It's, it's extremely common that vulnerabilities creep in because of uh, third-party software. So do programmers in certain programming languages uh, make fewer vulnerabilities? So we looked into this and we, we saw that on average, no. However, certain languages, there are certain vulnerabilities that are more likely to occur than others. And so looking at all of the, at all of the languages of vulnerabilities, we found that these are the most common vulnerabilities. So for .NET, it's broken access control. For Java, it's command injection. Uh, Node is XXE. And PHP and Ruby is SQL injection. So we tried to dig in a little more like why, why this might be the case. And we were asking the questions, you know, specifically, you know, is it the programmers of that language? Uh, is it the language itself? And kind of digging in deeper, we found it's it's a little bit of both, right? So programmers of the language are using certain certain syntax or certain things that are available in that language. So because of that, it makes certain vulnerabilities more, more common than, than others. Um, and then, you know, we also asked the question, what are the top vulnerabilities that developers fix incorrectly? So these are vulnerabilities that developers know they have, they may have some knowledge of them and they go to try to fix them and they find, you know, they don't fix them exactly correctly. So they're fixing them in a way where there might be you know, some gaps or something, and there's still a problem with these vulnerabilities. And so 
we found command injection and SQL injection are most often fixed incorrectly. And so we look at why that, that's the case, you know, it really comes down to developers wanting to go to regular expressions because they lack the formal training in understanding using you know, parameterized queries, you know, the right way to fix these vulnerabilities. And instead they think, oh, I have to filter out certain things for a particular case. And so that's why these are often fixed uh, incorrectly. So that, that was just some interesting data to kind of think through, you know, some of the issues developers have, think through how training can enable developers to make fewer vulnerabilities. Now I'm going to go into the, how do you create a successful secure coding training plan? So when thinking through how to come up with a successful secure coding training plan, you know, you want to improve the engagement. If you get developers engaged and they're interested and they're actually taking the training, you know, that's step one, right? And then the, the second most important thing is, okay, now we need to make sure it's effective and increase the effectiveness. So, so these are the two things we do at Hackedu. We really are, are focused on improving engagement and increasing effectiveness. If you do those two things, you'll see vulnerabilities um, uh, decrease in, in your software. And so this is recommendations based on working with hundreds, hundreds of customers over years and looking at the data. So we came up with, you know, best practice in terms of rolling out secure coding training. So first, looking at the training content, um, you know, we found that multiple choice videos, slides just don't cut it. For videos in particular, we've seen developers play videos in the background while they're coding. So they're not really paying attention. So it's really not effective. It's not engaging. Um, you know, multiple choice, it, it doesn't, that's not how developers learn. Developers are problem solvers. They wanna be thrown into a problem and try, try to solve that uh, in a more hands-on way. And then we've also heard from, from some companies um, that they, they tried a slide-based approach, um, you know, the, the uh, computer-based training where you click, you know, click through and kind of wa watch the animation run. And we heard that uh, for, for one, they looked at the statistics of the training afterwards and saw that developers were finishing lessons in like seconds because they were just clicking through as fast as they could. So obviously that's not effective. So requiring developers to actually code is extremely important. Getting them hands-on and practice vulnerabilities, because if they can do that, if they can find and fix vulnerabilities in other people's code, they're more likely to be able to avoid those mistakes in their own code. Um, and then third here, you know, offensive and defensive appro approach is very good. So as mentioned, with broken access control and broken authentication, it's less about one right way to fix it and more about having the mindset to think through you know, how are attackers looking at our applications. Um, you know, having that mindset and thinking through the fundamentals of these vulnerabilities uh, rather than just one way to fix it is extremely important. And so giving the offensive approach really helps uh, for that. And, and it helps them more solve for the general case rather than one, one specific case. So training schedule. Now we've, you know, working with organizations, uh, developers are more um, pressure today to write a lot of code, right? To, they got to get that product roadmap done. There's no time for training. They have to move forward. And so um, what we found is breaking up code into smaller portions, right? So like 20 minutes or so, um, and then assigning it throughout the year, not one chunk right away is extremely effective. So, you know, training continuously is makes it so it's not a one-time event, right? Developers aren't gonna take training, you know, for two days out of the year and then forget about it until next year. Um, you know, that's not an effective way to build the build learning and it doesn't follow learning science principles. So learning science principles say that learning should be continuous throughout the year and that knowledge should continually reinforce itself. So we recommend training every single month for two to three hours and breaking up the training into 20 to 30 minute chunks. And so that will help developers fit it in during compile time, during downtime, during testing, during, um, you know, when they just need a break from looking at code. And it really doesn't take away from the product roadmap. So this is a way where um, security can work with engineering such that it works for, for both organizations. So training topics. Um, so, you know, OWASP puts out obviously a lot of really great content, good lists on things to focus on. And so the o OWASP top 10 is a great, uh, a great place to start having the OWASP API top 10. If you do API or mobile, anything like that, focusing on the latest technologies and the latest attacks um, is, is extremely important. So 
if you're using new authentication, you know, different authentication technologies, you should be training on that. So JWT authentication or, or OAuth or something like that, train on the technologies that you're using. And then also, if there are any attacks that are newer, anything that, um, that might be interesting, learning those, um, those newer attacks to be aware of them uh, as you're developing your own code. Uh, and then lastly here, um, you know, using role-based uh, training. So training for particular roles. So front end might be taking different training than back end. Um, you know, QA might be taking different training as well. Um, there's usually a lot of overlap, but sometimes there are specific things for specific roles, as well as seniority as well, right? And someone who's new, uh, you know, out of out of college, they might have very different training than someone who's been uh, developing for for 20 years. So you want to have a variety of training to be able to uh, accommodate uh, your your whole um, development team. So, you know, then you know we talked a little bit how to make your training effective, things to focus on, but now how do you drive that engagement piece? How do you improve that? Uh, so one thing is having security and engineering team unity. Now this is very much, you know, organization specific. Some organizations have very good um, security and engineering unity. Uh, part of it, if, if you have good education and you're educating the engineers on some of these things, you can help bridge the gap between security and engineering. Another thing is, you know, not having um, training that's just like, you know, hey, we're going to do a week and stop everything, you know, making sure you're working with with engineering to have um, you know, good camaraderie and uh, working towards the same effort. Uh, having this, you know, that that ties in with security culture, management buy in, right? You want to have management, um, you know, at the highest levels buying into um, these programs and things. Luckily, today, it's much easier to have buy in from um, C-level executives on security uh, because of all the issues that have happened. Um, and then, you know, incentives. So we've seen there was one company we were working with. They gave away special backpacks that had a special logo just for, for their team, for their company. And they gave those away for everyone who completed training. We saw the rates of completion for, the, for that organization was just through the roof. Everybody wanted a backpack. Everyone wanted to complete the training. So they had a really great time uh, getting everybody on board and actually taking the training. So uh, we saw this not only with that organization, but several other organizations where they offered incentives. Um, so we saw it was so effective. We actually uh, created uh, a um, you know a feature within our platform called Hacky Rewards, where we actually offer a uh, similar thing all managed within our platform because we saw it is such an effective way to engage uh, developers and get them to actually go in, take the training and complete it. Uh, and then the, the last thing here is accountability. So engaging is great. You want to engage developers. Um, you want to get them doing the right thing. And if they don't, you also want to hold them accountable. So something that you can do um, is, hey, when developers check in code, is there a way that you can remind them to take training if they haven't? Or can you even, you know, some organizations won't do this, but, but some might have blocked them from checking in code if they haven't completed the training. Um, there's some tools out there that make this uh, available. We have a tool that that does something similar, and it's just another way to remind developers, hey, if you're checking in code into production, you should be making sure that you're up on your training. So now I'm going to get into, you know, how do you use your vulnerabilities to train your, your developers? So, you know, security metrics are something that I think as a, as a community, we all struggle with. What are the right metrics? How are you measuring the right things? This is very difficult. So instead of looking at you know metrics, let's look at you know the tools that are already in place. Uh, what tools can we leverage to improve the ROI of of training, right? And so looking at bug bounty programs, SaaS tools, DAS tools, your current training, aggregating all of that data, and then creating what what we call uh, adaptive training plans to really try to change developer behavior and help them think more uh, about security. And so what are adaptive training pl uh, plans? And so this is essentially taking all relevant vulnerabilities from developers, the number of vulnerabilities found, the severity of the vulnerabilities, applications where vulnerabilities are found, taking all of that information as well as developer knowledge, you know, what lessons have they taken? Where are they struggling? What are they having issues with? And then assigning highly relevant and timely lessons um, based on those to help fix the mistakes that they're making.
And so we've seen this is, is an extremely effective way to train developers. Um, not only is it targeting the issues where they're having problems, but it's also very hard for them to say, hey, I don't need security training. It's not relevant. I'm a senior developer. I don't make mistakes, right? If you're showing them like, hey, this is based on data and your actual code, then it's much more palatable for developers and for them to be able to um, take, take this training. So now I'm going to jump into a demo. And so I'm going to demo first uh, the HackyU platform, talk about how we try to improve uh, the ability to write uh, secure software, um, you know, boost um, uh, developers' understanding on how they they uh, um, the, how software systems are hacked and and decrease the time to solve security problems. So I'll walk through the HackyDo platform and then I'll move into how we use um, vulnerabilities to help train uh, train developers. So. So starting with um, the HackyDU platform. Uh, so this is the HackyDU platform. Um, this is just kind of general general training and I'm gonna walk through a particular lesson here. So um, if we go into our SQL injection part one lesson, the way our, uh, our training works is we have a tutorial on the left side. And then the most important thing we do is try to get developers hands-on as quickly as possible. As mentioned, we have, um, you know, we have the offensive side is where we start. So we'll walk through the offensive side of security and then um, and then move on to the defensive side. So here, for example, um, we have a real running web application. It's a sandbox for this, this particular developer. And so if I try to log in, I have, um, so inter intercept request is on and I have a proxy that's running. So I can see the requests that are going on to the server. I can modify requests and I could submit it to the server. So we're, we're starting to use the tools that security teams are using, that um, that you know uh, attackers are using to analyze applications. So it gives developers a better way to understand these things. And so, um, so we start with the offensive side of security. Uh, so, for example, you know this is SQL injection. There's a SQL vul injection vulnerability. Uh, we teach you know how would you go about exploiting this so you have a, a an understanding of this. And so, for example, here I was just able to break into this application. That's what we're, we're teaching developers here, um, but they're you know they're real vulnerabilities. The the platform is open for anyone to exploit this. You know, kill the uh, you know drop tables, kill the application, whatever. Completely fine if they ever get the application in a bad state, they just hit this reset sandbox, and they get a brand new one and can continue on with the application. So that's the offensive side. Then we move to the defensive side. And so for the defensive side, we uh, expose the source code. The developers can choose whatever language um, they want here. They select the language um, you know, that, that they develop in. Uh, then they have to find and fix the vulnerability in code. Once they, once they find and fix the vulnerability, they hit run tests. And tests are actually run. And they have to actually solve it correctly before they can pass a lesson and move on. So again, hands-on training, making sure that developers are actually coding is extremely important, and then making sure they're actually doing it correctly by running tests against it. So that's how our lessons work. Uh, we have a full library of, of, uh, of lessons, cover a lot of the OWASP topics, uh, additional topics. We have challenges to help gamify. So there's a lot going on uh, in our platform. But now moving over to, um, uh, to, to using your vulnerabilities, so, um, so as I mentioned, we have uh, integrations with SaaS tools, DAS tools, bug bounty programs. Everything is is kind of preloaded here, depending on what uh, what tools you use, and then you can connect it up. And for this, we have Hacker One connected for this um, organization. And as you can see here, it's kind of um, categorize the vulnerabilities that are found, right? So it's looking at the vulnerabilities, the severity, the numbers, all of those different things. And based on that, it's automatically assigning me um, training. So, you know, broken uh, authentication and session management. You know, as you can see here with this integration, you know, there, there's an issue there, right? And it's looking at, as I mentioned, maybe the severity is there more than others. Uh, Cross-site scripting is another issue. We actually have a, My, you know, the MySpace worm, which was a cross-site scripting issue. So um, maybe because I already took an initial uh, 
uh, cross-site scripting, but I'm still having problems, I'll get that assigned to me. So this is all happening automatically behind the scenes. And so that's how our training works in terms of, um, in terms of uh, looking and using your own vulnerabilities in code. So um, with that, um, I will pause and see if there are any questions.